Good morning, everyone. My name is Edward Hoyt, and on behalf of Commodix and our collaborators at the World Resources Institute Mexico, WRI Mexico, and the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, I am very pleased to welcome you to this webinar on electromobility in Mexico. Today, we will talk about the opportunities and challenges in this sector, which are key to the development of sustainable urbanism in Mexico. This session is the first of two sessions that Comonix, WRI Mexico, and EPRI are organizing. The second that will take place next week will focus on sustainable buildings. Our objective today is to highlight the real consequences of climate change and therefore the importance of promoting electromobility in Mexico, not only as a mitigator, but as an economically attractive and viable solution today. In recent years, the production and use of electric vehicles has grown rapidly in several countries globally, which has been driven by tax incentives and their advantages in terms of op operating costs. While it is true that Mexico is joining this global trend, there's still a long way to go in this country. However, it is important to note the efforts of Mexican companies and, and entrepreneurs to make electromobility a reality in the country. We believe that the case of Mexico deserves focused attention due to its relative importance as an emerging economy with an important industrial base including the automotive industry, by the way. Also, it's high level of urbanization compared to other countries with a similar level of development, and clearly it's levels of greenhouse gas emissions. I'd like to point out some general questions to frame this conversation. Given the expected and currently observed impacts of climate change in Mexico, and the role of transportation systems in the emissions, why is it a priority to rapidly increase the use of electric vehicles for transportation, as well as for goods handling? What are the main obstacles to the expansion of electric vehicles in Mexico? And understanding that the financing of this equipment is one of the main challenges and problems for replacing or renewing fleets, how can this be effectively solved? We will open a space for questions and answers and comments from the audience afterwards. We hope to have a productive discussion among all the participants. To learn more about this, we will have the participation of expert panelists in, in diverse areas of expertise. And we are honored to have with us today, Dr. Deborah Lay from the Economic Commission for Latin America. We also have uh, engineer Mariela Arceo Madriz from EPRI. We have Rodolfo Alvarez Chavez from Bimbo Group, Salomon Stro from Uber, Mexico, Nazareth Black of Saqua, Mexico, and Fernando Paez from WRI Colombia. To moderate this session, we are honored to have Dr. Fernando Tudela Abad. Dr. Tudela was an undersecretary for planning and environmental policy at Semarnat from 2003 to 2012. And he's been a professor and researcher at the Colegio de Mexico and is currently a consultant working with several organizations, including ECLAC. Now, before passing the floor to Fernando to start this session, I'd like to remind you to mute your microphones unless you are speaking. And this session has simultaneous interpretation available into English, and this will be recorded as well to be made available for those who could not attend today. Finally, we invite you to post your questions in the chat to be answered in the Q&A segment of this meeting. Having said that, the floor is yours, Fernando. Thank you so much, Fernand. Thank you so much, Ned. Thank you to all of the participants here today. Welcome to this webinar. It is a real honor for me to moderate this session today and to keep it in the 
time limits that unfortunately are quite strict. So this will limit the interventions from our panelists and those who are interested in asking questions as well. Now, electromobility is not a new subject matter. Few people might remember that the first self-propelled vehicle in history that reached the incredible uh, speed then of 100 kilometers an hour was an electric vehicle. That was 1899. A Belgian engineer, Emil Janetsen, son of a pneumatic and tire manufacturer, he designed and built the jamais content, the never satisfied vehicle. So this was a vehicle in the shape of a torpedo, which was mounted on a four wheel platform. And the question here then is, if we are talking about the last, ye last year of the 19th century, how come there was not an increasing linear a development and evolution of electric vehicles? Technology was there, technology was proven. This was the world record of speed at the time. And this is not a matter of one technology substituting another one. History is rather filled with advancements and steps back at, uh, around certain technologies. However, electromobility as any other type of transformation is a systemic effect that is dependent on batteries, that is depending dependent on how those batteries are being built and assembled and how this is perceived by society as well. So having made reference to this historical event, electromobility is moving forward in an inevitable way. And it's a fact currently. It's a fact both in Mexico and many other countries. However, the advancement speed is quite unequal. And it's not necessarily responding to the climate change challenges that we currently face. So in a way we are on the right path since it is a logical inevitable transition. However, the speed of advancement is very slow. However, not everywhere this is the case. For example, Norway last year reached a 90% of private vehicle sales to be electric in kind. The equivalent in China would be 16%. However, that 16% of electric vehicles sold in China is approximately half of the world sales. In other countries, like the United States, that number goes down to 5%. And that 5%, half of it corresponds to the sales in the continent. So there are many countries that have established a deadline for the transition towards electric technology. And this is how the expansion of electromobility is behaving right now. So it is my pleasure now to pass the floor to our panelists who will be presenting some specific stages of this process with a specific focus in Mexico and of course the private sector intervention, which in any way reflect a global reality, which is non-specific to Mexico, of course. 
It is then a great pleasure to pass the floor to, to Dr. Deborah Lay. She is a specialist in climate change in the Energy and Natural Resources Office, CEPAL, and she has been an author of several papers and reports around climate change and researcher on environment and energy. Okay, so Debbie, I'd like to pass the floor to you so that you can provide your comments. Regarding the importance of the immediate and accelerated, perhaps, growth of electromobility in transportation. Please go ahead, Debbie. Thank you very much, Fernando. It is great to see you here. Thank you so much to Comanix and WRI as well for the invitation to be here. So I will talk about what the most recent reports of IPCC show. This comes from Working Group 2. And I'd like to start this presentation not necessarily talking about electromobility, but rather the urgence of action. This is one of the points that has come out from the adapting IPCC discussions related to resilient measures to climate. This is uh, framed in terms of sustainable growth, low in emissions, but the basis is the same. We need to do an integration of mitigation and adaptation measures. That is to say, they can't be independent measures. To the left, we can see that we are talking about everyone's participation, not only governments or the private sector. All of the general population that can participate should participate in several spaces, either cultural, political, social, cultural, environmental, scientific, financial, all of it. And together, we will be able to set the path forward, which leads us to a resilient development to climate or a lower resilient environment to climate, which correspond to global temperatures rising. Now, the important point here is this dotted line that we see on top. This refers to the lost trajectories that have been um, a result of actions taken in the past. That is to say, due to the increase of emissions, there are some actions that are no longer available, either adaptation or implementation, because either the methods no longer exist or because we have reached a point of no return. For example, in certain species that have gone extinct, that would be an example, or coral reefs as well, very common example. So. This goes to mitigation as well, because even though we can reduce emissions continually, this could be quite costly in following years, because the impact that we will continue to see will continue to be more frequent and more intense. We're talking about heavy rain, storms, droughts, and this will have an impact in the current infrastructure. So when we talk about electromobility or any other option related to mitigation in terms of transportation or cities and roads, we need to take into account these impacts as well. I will be brief with this slide. What IPCC has been stating in, from the global report to 1.5 degrees, says that we need to move away from sectorial areas and more towards transition areas that allow, for example, for the participation of food, water, terrestrial, ocean, coastal systems, taking into account that one option 
for example, by means of smart devices or renewable energy or electromobility, one action impacts directly on another. Okay, so having said all of that, In terms of electromobility, just as I said before, it's not only electromobility per se in isolation. It's also about the energy infrastructure and roads, for example. How is the urban planning going? How is this being managed? How are cities and green areas being designed? but also taking into account the various synergies that could happen in the topic of adaptation. In the specific issue of electromobility, we see several advantages because if we assume that this will be done by means of renewable energy, then we will see a growth in emissions that goes towards mitigation, but also would allow us to reduce perhaps the increase of heat in urban areas. What allows us to have this multidimensional approach from the economic and environmental and socio-physical, this is quite feasible, however, but there are certain places in which there are technology barriers and institutional barriers technological in terms of costs and availability in some areas and institutional barriers more focused in terms of the regulatory side of things and policy. Taking that into account, the feasibility increases when you combine it with other options. I understand that my time is running out, but just to wrap up, I believe that we have one decade of action so that these transformations occur. We have one decade to act before these options are no longer viable or available, even though a decade sounds like very little. The, we had, that's a good news because we still have things to do. Thank you so much, Debbie, for this. Thank you for your participation. This is a very good reminder of two fundamental aspects. On the one side, that the window of opportunity for mitigation is closing rapidly. So in this decade, we have two years gone by already. And another aspect which is extremely important is how the electromobility space and technological innovation depend on a social ecosystem, I would call it, of several areas or things that need to happen in the social, economic, technological realities of countries, even beyond electromobility. So those are points that we need to bear in mind throughout our conversation. Now, it is my pleasure to pass the floor to, to Mariela Arceo, she is a researcher of the Electric Power Research Institute in California, and she is an expert in general electric vehicles. Her research has been focused on cargo vehicles, light and heavy, and Her research has also had some impact in the design of lithium batteries, which is something very much on the agenda of Mexico in terms of access to this mineral. So, Mariela, the floor is yours now for six minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'd like to start talking about electrification, which is a bigger movement beyond 
portar a lo que es una transición justa y no dejar atrás comunidades o aspectos de temas que aspects or que incluyen temas humanitarios, sociales, económicos y ambientales. Um, y me toca hablar un poquito sobre el ecosistema de so I will la ele focus el on perdón, la transportación eléctrica of electric, electric voy a empezar por lo que es la disponibilidad, disponibilidad de vehículos y hemos visto en estas situaciones que muchas veces la disponibilidad de Our vehículos está muy that vehicle um, relacionada is con very related países o regiones que tienen políticas para el desarrollo de vehículos About um, a pesar de que estamos en una pandemia mundial, hemos visto la, la demanda para estos vehículos, pandemic, más de 6.6 millones de vehículos se han vendido mundialmente. Grown, more than 6 y algunos ejemplos de vehículos que hemos visto son sold. requerir And cierto número de vehículos que se han vendido y otras cosas como beneficios de estacionamiento gratuito o a bajo from the roads and also to manufacture low cost También, electric vehicles. Um, Now, viendo que el mercado se está talking about availability, we've seen that the market is expanding in the regions. Este Manufacturers cambio, are positively responding to this no, change. No han, no han dicho que no se puede hacer, sino And they ya have estamos not viendo que para resisted. el 2023 va a haber mucho be made, más opciones para diferentes saying that by 2026, en el transporte de los vehículos. Cuando se trata de la carga para estos vehículos, Now, in terms of cargo, el 80 in de terms la carga of para los charging those vehicles, we can see that 80% of en casa, passenger uh, vehicles trabajo, are geared towards home use. Then we have 15% for work and 5% for public. The reason why the public charge is smaller is because this is usually only También used when we are doing a longer commute or en el, su hogar porque no todos viven en casa, entonces como apartamentos o solo rentan, We are entonces not no only pueden about implementar homes, but um, also el cargador. Y allí es un reto, cases, pero también se transforma en una oportunidad para um, poder este, ver cómo podemos hacer esto y incluir a diferentes personas, diferentes capacidades. In order to include as well different Cuando se trata de flotas, es un poquito diferente porque cada flota tiene su propia manera de ser. Entonces, hay dos maneras mayormente que se han utilizado. La primera es la carga en estación, case. que simplemente es cuando el vehículo no se está usando, donde se estaciona, ahí no se pueden instalar cargadores, y eso es donde la carga. Charging stations can be y luego está lo que es built la carga en ruta and then we have y la carga en ruta si se ha visto más utilizada por autobuses cuando los pasajeros more, van subiendo o bajando um, el vehículo puede cargar a, en una potencia muy alta pero también se ha visto y, bus, pero no se ha formado muy bien lo que es la carga en ruta para We have not seen carga many applications y eso es porque for los on de route flotas for public um, pueden ser más grandes, entonces no pueden utilizar lo que ya está size, para los vehículos so pasajeros, no caben en Entonces allí también igualmente es un reto, pero también so es una oportunidad para ver cómo podemos solucionar esto. Es otro reto, pero también es una oportunidad para ver cómo podemos solucionar y luego para poder tener nuestros vehículos, vehículos eléctricos también necesitamos saber que alguien nos tiene que dar esa electricidad y aquí son las empresas de electricidad. Y hay demasiadas cosas que algunas empresas and ya están haciendo o pueden hacer. Measures and y aquí things that tengo muchos puntos, pero solo voy a hablar de tres. Um, el primero um, que quiero hablar es garantizar que se pueda cargar ahora o en el futuro y planificar 
Entonces, y vehículo una, can be charged veces, now or in the future um, and then solo pensamos, for that. okay, aquí en cinco años que podemos Sometimes hacer, we can think that, okay, what can we do más a largo plazo if from one to five years, but we need to think at a longer eh, term creciendo, podamos, so that when uh, the movement of electric vehicles is actually vehículos, growing, we can actually support the needs of those vehicles then, either for fleet um, vehicles or residential el siguiente use. Es, Revisar asignación de costos. The next Entonces, point is to si en review los, cost uh, allocation. En los planes no hay alguna actualización de red, If there are um, no ya sea update otra vez plans para los regarding the network for residential clients or fleets, we eso. need to think about how um, to specifically do that. Dial Luego, and finally, con to de start a dialogue with public service companies that are working in that specific area in order to coordinate no, regional um, charging networks no for electric vehicles and be able to provide that service Entonces, for customers. Con esto concluyo, es that would una be transición it global. for my presentation. No this is a global transformation. We should not lag behind. This is happening and this can actually Gracias. contribute to a just transition. Thank you so much, Mariela, for that. In this articulation between technology and this socio ecosystem, there are many aspects to be considered. One of which is whoever wants to go into electromobility has this basic question of how do I charge it? Where do I charge it? At what cost? So we see that the investment, initial investment cost is quite high. This might change in the following decade. But this is the case so far. And if we add maintenance and other type of costs uh, will be lower in the long run. Thank you for reminding us about these specific issues. Now, I will pass the floor to Rodolfo Alvarez. He is the head of Electromobility Committee of a company that has a, a big investment in electromobility so far. And he will present the case of the transformation that they've had towards electric vehicles with a fleet of more than a thousand vehicles that are going around the city and the country. Now, Rodolfo, the floor is yours to talk about briefly of the experience of the Bimbo Group. Thank you very much, Fernando. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm very pleased to share in these six minutes our experience. What are the advantages that we've seen in replacing our fleets for electric vehicles, particularly talking about the experience of Bimbo Group? When I was preparing for this intervention, uh, I was thinking that there's an advantage in emission reduction, either those pollutants that harm human beings or the ozone layer. There are, another, there are other advantages like noise pollution, but all of those we know. We know that those are good advantages about this technology. But I would like to show what are, what is a different vision of what could also represent advantages of this migration towards electromobility. So let me just share three specific points. The first one is image. And when I talk about image, I am not only talking about a good perception of an electric vehicle that might be very well um, created or designed, but something that goes beyond that to communicate the idea of electromobility to everyone looking at it. It's not only a poster with nice colors. No, the idea is to communicate the idea that electromobility is not, only, it's not the future only, it's the present. We are developing it now and we are moving forward. And with that, we try to communicate in the mind of the collective that we are walking in that direction. And I'm talking about the whole world. This is not a matter of one company or an issue 
for one country. This is something that is going to happen around the world. Electromobility is a reality, is where we're all heading. So we need to prepare ourselves from today. The weeks and months and years that go by, these are opportunities that if we do not take advantage of, will no longer be available later on when we talk about sustainability. The second point in terms of advantages that I'd like to share with you is the drive. And what I mean is that as a fleet, we're talking about a volume that we can contribute or we can even pressure, if you will, pressure positively those who manufacture technologies or develop technologies so that they can know what are the needs of the market and needs about the needs of private individuals or companies or staff um, moving in transportation and cargo. It is very important for us that manufacturers know what is being needed. And also, what are the different options of categories or vehicles that need to be available? So it is important for us to communicate those needs. What type of vehicles are needed in the first place? What are the capacities that we need? What kind of autonomy? In many cases, manufacturers are focused in developing vehicles of long autonomy when there are certain segments in our distribution efforts that actually have a very little or low type of trips. Some people might think that Bimbo, with all of our vehicles, we have long trips. But in reality, every unit has a very short route, but we have many routes. So manufacturers need to understand what kind of needs we have. That is why it is important to work on those needs and communicate them to manufacturing and developers so that those units that are adequate for each every segment are actually developed. The last point and the most important in my mind is learning. What have we learned during these years is absolutely incredible. We know that electromobility is the future, but we need to learn what's coming. We need to know and understand where are we headed. And the way that we have walked since 1994, when the first recreational vehicles were turned into cargo vehicles, and we started to understand what needed to be modified in the infrastructure in order to set up the charging stations and to know, for example, the demand in specific areas so that that specific vehicle has the capacity to provide the corresponding energy to our vehicles has been a big learning for us. We have gone deep in these types of learning. We have been trying to quickly adapt in, the, in recent months, and this has allowed us to adapt. We started off with very basic technology with acid lead battery. I will not go into in, in depth in, tech, in technical aspects, but now we are evolving to lithium batteries, which is not such a new technology, but it's the one that we are currently using. And later in, in following years, we might see different types of materials, hydrogen and many others that might not be known right now that will improve electromobility but that we need to be aware of right now so that we are ready when everybody will have the possibility to migrate to these technologies. Fortunately, we have been able to start around this and we are working strongly in this develop and development. And it is important for us to share this in forums like this one because it is important to move forward. It's not easy, but it is possible. Thank you very much, Rodolfo. I believe that you would agree that this sector that you have of cargo fleet, fleets in companies could be one of the access points for, tech, for technological transformation of electromobility in the most viable way. At first, because the demands of autonomy are not so big, as you just mentioned, the access of charging stations is in charge of the company. So 
it's actually in the benefit of everyone for this step to actually be successful because you are opening doors you are actually creating a path forward for others so i am convinced that uh, bimbo is not uh, regretting in any way this decision so congratulations on that our next participant today is Salomon Straw. He heads the operations or vehicle operations at a regional level of Uber. Uber is another very important player in this socio ecosystem that is very linked to different technological evolutions of electromobility. This is changing a lot of perceptions, different mindsets even around the need of owning a vehicle, for example, to some other models that were complicated to implement at first, but that are quite dominant currently. So we'd love to hear the Uber experience in terms of electromobility in Latin America and also the local experience of Uber in Colombia. So Salomon, welcome. Thank you very much, Fernando. It is an honor to be here. Thank you so much to the organizers, to me, um, for, for the invitation that you did to me and Hugo. And it is important for us to continue contributing to the strengthening of this type of sustainable mobility, which is so important. As you were, say, as you were saying, I, am, I, I come from the electric mining industry and then I studied in management. And I have seen in several years, a electromobility be very uh, geared towards passenger um transportation and i am working in recent years in trying to find solutions for our uh, suppliers and our drivers many of them don't have access to their vehicle in general and this is a very important conversation point and we try to find different solutions we have financing solutions for them we have other type of solutions related to vehicle manufacturing, all the way to other type of alliances with companies that might buy those vehicles and then they are rented out to drivers so that they can actually generate some economic, additional economic um, opportunities. As everyone know, I believe, Everyone knows uh, Uber by means of its technological platform options, mobility options that are accessible, safe and sustainable. And we want to make it even more so. For example, Mexico is a part of the top five markets in the world for Uber. We generate income for around 200,000 drivers and, and delivery um personnel so we've been in mexico since 2013 i am colombian and i live in mexico for some years and i'm very happy to be here i really love this country for many reasons and as everyone knows as well we have been made public our commitment as a company to have a hundred percent of our trips zero emissions by 2040 this is a global commitment and it's a huge one and we believe it's quite hard to reach but we are working on it every day and we work in many different ways around that we are generating several initiatives we have the european market and the u.s market which are much more developed in terms of fleets and electric vehicles in the us for example we agreed with tesla and hertz to have more than 50,000 electric vehicles available for our driver partners and depending on the region we can actually accelerate the rhythm and the pace as many other panelists have talked about depending on the 
ecosystems of well as well. So in, in particular, in Mexico, I would like to talk about two specific initiatives that we have been working on. The first one is called Uber Planet. This is a product that exists in many countries around the world, including Mexico, by which users, by means of an additional fee, they can, co they can um, compensate their carbon footprint. And in this way, we can we can do an offset of the carbon footprint. And by means of these funds, drivers can change their vehicles to electric vehicles. So this is, of course, one of the main ways of supporting this ecosystem because the financing of vehicles, as we know, particularly in Latin America, and of course in Mexico is quite complicated. The cost is quite high still. And for most drivers, it's quite difficult to have access and to buy a vehicle, a combustion engine vehicle, and it would be even more so for an electric one. Now, the second initiative that I'd like to refer to is that additionally to a series of pilot programs that we have in the region for electric vehicles, the most important partnership that we have in Mexico is with a company called Vemo, which is very focused on electromobility. And with this company, we are expecting actually to increase our be electric vehicle and hybrid vehicle fleet. And this year, and no doubt next year, we will see this company more with several vehicles and models. And we actually have learned many lessons from this collaboration. And one of the main ones that I would like to share with you all is that when we talk about non-private fleets or non-private use, it is fundamental to optimize the general ecosystem, particularly because the capex, that is to say the cost is relatively high to the, uh, to the alternatives. So we believe that the operational cost is much lower. Maintenance costs are lower. And also the saving in terms of fuel is huge. And of course, we hope that by means of these results, we can actually improve the cost of insurance. This will be a fundamental piece, but still not enough to offset the cost of the asset, particularly in those countries where we are not manufacturing these products. So in any case, this experience has shown us that if we optimize this type of costs, we can start being at a level with those non-electric solutions and of course in the environmental point of view. So let me just tell you what optimization from the point of view of the ecosystem means. On the one side, the type of vehicles, not all vehicles are applicable for every use. I believe that Rodolfo was talking about that, and that is very interesting. And we've seen that in several fleets, depending on the autonomy and depending on the use, will certain vehicles will be good for that, and certain technologies will be used for that, and while in other fleets, we will need a different one. We hope that certain solutions like hydrogen and others will complement the efforts because this there will be a benefit of having a fast charge, for example. Currently, electric vehicles require one or two hour charging times. And in fleets, we need to optimize every minute and every second, which is the case of mobility solutions like Uber, which affect, of course, plenty what can be done. So this type of vehicles is fundamental in terms of their technology. The infrastructure for the recharge. So we found in some places in the world that there are chargers that are not connected or they're not smart, quote unquote. So there are drivers who design the right route to reach one of the chargers and then they get there and it turns out that it's 
out of service or there's a three vehicle queue and this lack of efficiency really impacts these kinds of fleets because we need to optimize them as much as possible to compensate for the cost of the asset so all of that infrastructure is going to be essential salomon sorry we're short on time yeah okay i'm gonna wrap it up sorry but we need to stick to the schedule so i have one observation that we need to take into account in this discussion because uh, we're talking about the dramatic geopolitical movements that we are seeing these months this has also produced an increase in the price of traditional fuels for combustion engines so this could help accelerate the transition towards eco-mobility if we know how to use that. So $5 for a gallon of gas in the U.S. right now, which is unprecedented for many years. If we don't take advantage of this crest in the wave, we would be making a mistake. Okay, so now I'm very happy to give the floor to Nazareth Black. She is a CEO of a startup company. Well, she's got experience in selling vehicles, but also in production of vehicles with electromobility. So she will briefly talk about her own experience. And I would love for Nazareth to share that with us right now. Tell us about the meaning of these technological options and your business vision. Nazareth, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Fernando, for the opportunity of sharing the experience that we have in the sector. So trying to be a little bit brief and telegraphic, there are two questions that they asked me to answer. One is the challenges and the advantages of making electric vehicles in Mexico. So there's a lot of advantages. One has to do with improving the quality of life for everyone. And that is the one that we should all be striving for. We should try to improve everybody's quality of life. So decreasing the statistics in terms of the number of deaths because of the emissions in the vehicles that we use. We should not lose people on the roads uh, along the way because of the pollution generated by the cars that we use, especially when we have much more eco-friendly options available nowadays. Now, what about the challenges? The most important for us is that if we consider what kind of company we are. We are a family business, we are a small business, and we were born electric. And we are starting to compete with global players, with very large companies. So that means a lot of challenges. I think the most important one of all has been, has stemmed from a goal that we set for ourselves. When you build a car, you need to bring in parts from wherever you can find them. So bricks from China, the battery from somewhere else, and so on, so on. This is how it's always been. In the history of the car industry in over 130 years, there has never been a car built with 100% locally sourced parts. So speaking of electromobility and the large amount of opportunities that exist and the positioning of Mexico within the global industry, we set for ourselves the goal of building the first car ever 100% locally sourced. So I think this is going to be a challenge and it could also help reduce the emissions if we don't have to transport parts from everywhere on, on different regions. This will help build an ecosystem to tend to this industry. This industry that is a nascent industry, right? The technology has been around for a long time, for many years. However, the adoption is quite new. So this could also help curb emissions. So the main challenge for us is to work on this development 
or providing local parts. In our country, as in everywhere, we're seeing a transition in terms of the supply chains to deal with this transition for electric vehicles. So it's been hard. And I think that's the main challenge for us. We're doing well. We are at about 60% today. There are certain things that we have decided to do ourselves within our plant. For example, in terms of the electronics, that's our own infrastructure. We have technological independence, which is extraordinary. Then there are other parts that we are now building at the plant, like the transmission harnesses and other smaller parts. Then there's a topic that I think is even more important, financial alternatives to make it easier to sell these vehicles. And this is really just about how do we make it so that Mexico sells more electric cars and a lot faster? How do we do that? If we consider that prior to the pandemic, more than a million and a half light vehicles per year were being sold in the country, and less than 300 were fully electric, right? So I'm talking about one and a half million cars out of which only 300 or less were electric. So how, how do we move? How do we transition? I like to think outside the box and I have the privilege of having participated in all of the parts of the process from the concept of the cars, how they get built and then how you sell them. This allows me, this expertise, my knowledge on the battlefield. I've been for 18 years working on this sector, and I spend a lot of time talking to people directly so that I can get to understand the processes that lead them to choose a perfect car for them. So I live the industry from that front. And I always like to think outside the box and I, and I identify two challenges that need to be overcome to achieve this goal, you know, selling more electric cars and faster. One has to do with the culture of sustainable mobility. We don't have that kind of culture in our country. This is normal because for many years it was not an important topic. It started to gain relevance when we felt the water up to our neck, right? So for many decades and many generations, we have consumed cars in the same way. And there's this established pattern, pattern and habits of consumption. So people don't think about that. They just continue on with that pattern. So to connect all these concepts, right, from beginning to end, I think we need to work a lot on re-educating or educating people differently so that we can shift these habits of consumption of vehicles. And I'm talking about using education as the main instrument to raise this kind of awareness for sustainable mobility. So basically in order is education as the main tool so that people can really think about and truly reflect upon what's happening. What is my own personal responsibility for all these airborne particles that are killing people? We need to face this head on. There's no time to being to, for being diplomatic. The airborne particles that are killing people that are coming from cars, they have a name and a last name, and it's our name, you know, when we use these cars that pollute. So we need to go through this process of reflection and then create this awareness and say, yeah, we need to stop doing this. And when you move from this, to not uh, choosing not to do that anymore, not to perpetuate these patterns, this helps us foster this culture of sustainable mobility. You can't force people to do this if they don't have the will to do it. Another point, briefly, is financing. Electric vehicles are not really that much expensive. That's one of the myths that persist. That's another topic. But in our country, all cars cost, whether they cost 200, 300,000 pesos. People, we don't have the economic capacity to buy a car in full in cash. That is why 7.8 or 8% of 
or rather eight or every 10 cars in our country are sold with some kind of finance. That is a majority. Again, this provides us some clarity. You know, we can say all cars are costly for us. That is why we use credits and leasing and so on. So the answer to get them to sell them faster, it's not to lower the costs and democratize and everything people go on about. No, the secret is to transform the industry that finances these cars so that people can have this financial tool to acquire an electric vehicle. So it's not about the price, but about the monthly payments to be affordable, accessible. Maybe one of the topics is on the longer term, well, electric vehicles have a longer lifespan than traditional vehicles. So that's a plus. These are the two most important points, in my opinion, so that we can sell more electric cars and do it faster. Muchas gracias, Nazareth. Thank you so much, Nazareth. I think one of the aspects you mentioned has to do with the geopolitical transformation that I mentioned before. We are now questioning the globalization mechanisms, the traditional ones before the pandemic, before the war in Ukraine, and there are some serious limitations that are starting to pop up in terms of the supply chains. So in this context, the effort in, that SACWA makes in being local providers for the inputs for building the cars, well, that is very timely and it's an inevitable transition in the context of what we are living through right now. And then the emphasis on the financial impact is also essential. And Nazareth is reminding us of something very important, the longer longevity of this product. This product, every unit has about 20 moving parts compared to 100 plus moving parts of conventional vehicles. So the opportunities for tear, wear and tear, for breaking down, they are lower. We need to take this into account as well in terms of the financing. So thank you so much, Nazareth. Now I want to give the floor to Fernando Paez, the director of WRI, World Resource Institute in Colombia. He has a lot of experience in Mexico dealing with ur urban mobility. He and it's no accident. I can mention here that he was the general manager he was the father of the experiences of rapid transit in Latin America, the, in the transmillennial in Bogota. So he is linked to a lot of the planning instances in the Colombian context. These are also a source of experience for him, very valuable experiences. So, Fernando, what would you say about the process of electrification in the context of a new focus that is starting to generalize, and Mexico was one of the first to, to adopt this also, these new modes of public transportation? in confined lanes. Fernando, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Fernando. So to me, it is really important to share some of the elements that we've been learning about through these processes of electrification of transport in urban transportation. And I'd like to go back to some elements for the development of this conversation. First, the urgency like Deborah said at the start, because the transportation sector, it's one of the main emitters of pollutants 
and greenhouse gases that have contributed to climate change. And that's why it is key to, to focus on this topic. There's a lot of urgency. We also need to consider in terms of the emissions of greenhouse gas emissions and where they come from in Latin America is 30 plus percent from Mexico is 35 percent coming from these vehicles. And this has an impact, just like Nazareth was saying, in terms of the impacts on people. 8.7 million people at the global level die as a consequence of atmospheric pollution. This is a delicate topic, so we need to figure out how we can reduce these emissions. And one of the elements is electromobility, of course. How do we make it so that electromobility, one of the technological alternatives that can help us curb these emissions, how can we apply them to the public transportation sector? So in Mexico, about 40% of the population use public transportation, that is 50 million people, mainly for commuting to work. And it's a sector that employs a lot of people, about 160,000 workers, mainly associated with the drivers. But also public transportation enables you to do daily activities, especially for people whose household income is under 7,000 pesos. But in terms of technology, well, public transportation is facing a crisis, and this is a pre-pandemic crisis. But it became deeper because of the pandemic, which has had really complex effects in terms of the functioning, right? And what mobility is one of the keys. So this is why it is urgent to tend to this crisis so that we can have public transportation services that are helpful to the cities that are a lot more accessible, inclusive, and sustainable. And of course, this requires an entire transformation process that includes technology, but it also goes beyond technology. So for this transformation process towards fleets with lower emissions, we need public policies that make it possible to, to do this shift. But we also need to strengthen the institutions, not just government institutions, but the transportation operators. And we need to try to find better business models to make this change viable. But there's another important challenge, which is infrastructure. And there's it's a topic that accept, affects people talking about these services, which includes these kinds of technologies. So we need to consider certain elements of the technology, vehicles, batteries, and the infrastructure that is necessary for loading, which means considering aspects with technical planning, operational planning, but also financial planning. And in this case, for public transportation, the solution goes beyond that, beyond the vehicle itself. It's not just about choosing the best vehicle, but about designing a system based on the needs and the specific characteristics of the service, considering the available technology. But this means looking at the context very closely. So electric fleets for a public transportation system will carry benefits that are very clear. And we can see them because some public transportation systems are already working with electric vehicles. The benefits are curbing the emissions, obviously, local pollutants, an improvement in the quality of the air, and also mitigating climate change. And they are safer, they have fewer risks for the health of people. Another element from the perspective of this system is that with the vehicles in operation and these systems like in Bogota, Medellin, and some places in Mexico as well, we see that the initial costs, which were a great concern at first for these kinds of projects, well, these are being reduced 
but also maintenance and operational costs are reduced. So these are greater efficiencies that can tell us that this change is possible. So we are breaking paradigms. We are learning about these operations and their resistance to change in terms of this kind of technology is keeps getting lower and lower. And so we are finding that companies are working on technological development. What do we need to focus on? What about Mexico? Well, in public policy that are much more aligned and where there are a lot more incentives for technology and for certain models that are more appropriate. In terms of the business model, it's important to say that the equation is changing. The responsibility was for transport operators. And now it is viable if we divide the load in terms of who provides the fleet, who does the maintenance, who provides the energy, who provides the infrastructure. And these, this kind of combination of stakeholders is enabling us to move towards having viable projects in terms of the electric fleets for these transportation systems. So the focus needs to be on infrastructure, operation, financing, and we also need to consider that in order to link these kinds of projects, which goes back to some of the elements that have been mentioned throughout today, is being clear about the market. What is the market offering in terms of vehicle technology so that we can build this technology based on the context, but also we need to analyze the needs of these systems, the supply and the demand and everything else so that based on these elements, we can really ground everything in terms of financing, business models, hiring models, and so on. And of course, we also need to consider the impact. In WRI, we have applied these methodologies in different cities, in Colombia, in Mexico, and elsewhere. And what's important about this? Well, we are learning. Like Rodolfo said, these learnings around technology, around infrastructure, around batteries, around everything, are allowing us to have more viable projects, more and more. Now in Mexico, there are electric vehicles operating in Guadalajara. There's important information being gathered there, adjustments being made. In Mexico City, an important factor is the cable car network and imbuing it with newer technology. The Metro bus as well is gathering information for the newer lines by including zero emission vehicles. So change is possible. These projects are possible and there's a lot of opportunity for learning so that public transportation can migrate, can make this transition and contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you so much, Fernando. I have one observation. Of course, this transformation towards electromobility has to do with, like you and others said, with shifting paradigms and is mostly based on organizational transformations, right? Organizational changes in all the different orders than strictly in an inter-vehicle change, right? So all that's left for me to say is to, well, to apologize to the participants because I've been very inefficient as a moderator. I've taken up a lot of time, so I'm going to be careful with, with, with the questions. I have a lot of questions that I won't be able to ask so that we can move to some questions from the participants instead, and then we'll see how much time we, we have. We have about 20 minutes left. Luis Godoy is saying the following about the fiscal incentives, tax incentives for light vehicles in countries like Mexico. 
the subsidy, which wouldn't just be a subsidy for technology, by the way, but in the case of Mexico, the most important thing right now is a subsidy for gas, right? That's really having an impact in public financing. I mean, there's a lot of money really destined to subsidizing sectors that are not the ones with the greatest needs, but I mean, that's how it is. And the hard thing is to generate a sustainable program of individual incentives. Would anybody like to briefly answer this about tax incentives? Um, Nazareth? Okay, so speaking of fiscal incentives in Mexico, right, and in terms also of getting an electric vehicle, I think these incentives are good. Of course, there could be more, right, obviously, but the ones that I, I've seen, they seem to be enough. And if to that, we add other elements like the ones we've mentioned before, like the lifespan of the vehicle, savings in fuel, and maintenance, and so on, then I think the general outlook is very favorable. What are the incentives today? There's a tax for new cars that you're free of. That is 10% of the value of the vehicle. It's not nothing. It's 10%. It's a lot. Then you also don't pay for the yearly vehicle tax. If you're a company and if you want to deduct something from 175,000, you go to 250,000 in terms of the deductions, which means you can deduct a lot more. And of course, you can also deduct the, your rents if you're using some kind of leasing system, which is also favorable because a lot of people today, there's some transition and a, a movement today. And there's a lot fewer people registered at the EMS. So you can have this, these kinds of benefits when you acquire your electric vehicle. So these are the incentives that exist today. Then as a company, we have, we've been promoting an initiative everywhere in Congress since we started. And this is a proposal where we say, well, get rid of the VAT tax. There's very few electric vehicles being sold today. I mentioned some figures already. So let's say 16% that we pay in electric vehicles. So what we're proposing is that in order to incentivize, they should get rid of the VAT. And then over 16 years, you start adding it back what 1%. So if you buy an electric car in 2022, your VAT is going to be zero. Next year, 1%. Next year, 2%. Until after 16 years, we're back to the original 16%. This will really help us with these goals for transition. So that 50% of the electric vehicles sold by 2030 can be fully electric. And, but we've run out against the wall, really. Even though we can show this in numbers, in terms of the vehicles that are sold, this would really not have an impact on the state's funds. Regardless, they have not supported this. So can it exist? Yes, of course. Will it exist? Who knows? Because it hasn't happened yet. So I'm betting on teaching people, right? So at the company, we're at your service to teach you how to crunch these numbers and how with the existing incentives today, we can achieve this transition and show people these great numbers so that they invest in an electric vehicle. Again, time is against us, but there's another question here that has to do with linking the objectives to the Pi Paris Agreement, like zero net emissions. By the middle of the century. And this is a very specific question for Salomon. How, I mean, this discussion that we're having today, you know, this preliminary initial discussion, we would we'll have to go deeper into it. But how does this relate to 
obtaining, I mean, some countries, unfortunately not all of them, but in terms of zero emissions, that is really the only way of having any kind of hope for meeting the goal to, to stop global warming at 1.5 degrees as per the Paris Agreement. Another observation that I, I want to mention is that when we talk about pollution and about the benefits of electromobility, well, yeah, maybe a vehicle has zero emissions, but if the electricity that we are using in this system, if it comes from a and a, a power plant that uses fossil fuels, then maybe it will turn out that in terms of the air quality, the in, in the end it might be a net negative, right? This shift. So since the question was addressed to Salomon, I'm going to ask him if he has anything to say about this more macro vision for the zero emissions goal and the introduction of urban electromobility. Yes, Fernando. I think I answered that in the chat. I don't, I'm not sure you were able to see that. That was more a more efficient way of doing it. But in terms of the question, well, the goal is having by 2040 zero emissions, regardless of the technology, right? The goal is net zero emissions by 2040. That's basically it. And that objective in the US, Canada, and Europe in 2030, which is almost here. So I think that has been very interesting. And we need a lot of players contributing to this end. So from the perspective of our industry, we hope to be able to contribute to that end. OK, well, these objectives of the Paris Agreement, they're very important. We need to consider the role of mobility which is limited, but we need to use all the adaptation and mitigation measures. We cannot forego any of them because this is an emergency where you know everything that we can do to combat the emissions, we need to do it and we need to do it now because it's not a problem of the future, it's a current problem. Another intervention, Nestor Lopez is saying, that well how to how to make it cheaper how to reduce costs something was already mentioned in these interventions i think nasa did the costs of electric vehicles in mexico the cheapest is half a million pesos so this leads us to talking about financing again and if somebody would like to clarify something about the initial high cost of adopting this technology, this might be a good moment to do that intervention. I would like to mention, Fernando, that in the case of public transportation and the inclusion of electric fleets in public transportation, one of the elements is the high cost of the initial investment, right, in terms of linking this fleet. But we've also seen that even though that initial investment is very high, the reduction in the cost for operations and maintenance really balances all of that out in the end. And it can make it really viable to have these kinds of projects. So I think we need to look at it from the perspective of the whole lifespan of the vehicle. And this is essential for public transportation, for example because in terms of structuring the projects and the business models, we need to consider this factor. We need to make it viable. Now, the technological development, especially when it comes to batteries, this means that the initial investment, you need to see an important reduction in cost there. So yeah, the evolution of the technology on the one hand, but also about the useful life of the vehicle. 
and see what it means really, this cost of getting an electrical vehicle once it's operational. Okay, well, there's a lot of concerns. All of them are very valuable. Unfortunately, we're going to have to limit these interactions because of the time. So there's a lot of questions about education, about the demand, a demand that is always articulated with like an offer like Nazareth was saying, an emerging offer. And the effort of the transformation, I mean, one of the questions is about whether it's worth it, whether the effort makes sense. It's quite a notable effort, not just in financial terms, but also in terms of the mentality, the mindset, the change. The topic again is, like when a doctor says uh, you should uh, stop smoking or you should uh, eat better, right? Sometimes all of these habits make it so that these suggestions that can seem very rational can be very hard to implement. So I would say that climate change and the recent worsening in the air quality of a lot of cities, this has made us change. So either we do, do it the good way or the bad way. Right now we're choosing the bad way. We're realizing that we're living in an unsustainable situation. In sustainable in terms of the environment, in terms of the human dimension, in terms of technology, and so on and so forth. We are really running into a wall, so let's stop bumping into the wall, because that's not really advisable, right? So we need to adjust, we need to change, and that is not just about a sacrifice, it's a test for the species' intelligence. We want to survive together with the other species in the planet. Does anybody want to talk about this relationship between the cultural cost of the transformation versus the benefits? A mí me gustaría agregar a otro punto de vista. I would like to este, creo que muchas veces los vehículos eléctricos solo suelen decir el beneficio es ambiental, pero hay muchísimas cosas más. Y uno de ellos, como si estamos hablando con consumidores y queremos decirles, este vehículo es mejor, tenemos que decir por qué. Y si vemos cómo funciona un vehículo eléctrico, no solo el mantenimiento es a bajo costo, no solo la electricidad es más a bajo costo, pero la eficiencia está al 80%. Y en cambio, un vehículo de combustión interna solo tiene la eficiencia del 16 al 25%. Entonces tenemos que pensar qué es el interés al consumidor y cómo podemos convencerlos que estos vehículos no solo son para un bien ambiental, sino para ellos mismos cómo les va a beneficiar personalmente. Porque tristemente a veces es la manera que tenemos que um, marque esta, este movimiento porque es una decisión, es yo creo la segunda decisión más grande después de comprar una casa um, que toma un consumidor y tenemos que tomar esto en cuenta para ellos también. Yo acuerdo, yo and also remember that in the case of Uber, for example, it's very clear. It's not just about individual acquisition, right? It can be collective. It can be ways of socializing this so that there's not individual ownership, but instead it's a semi-public good. There are other mechanisms for negotiating. 
Any other questions? Well, there's another one about how in Mexico we're just only getting started with this learning curve. So when would it be realistic to think that the transformation of the paradigm, the shift in mobility, at least urban mobility, at least in terms of public transportation, will be a reality? When? And I think that really depends on a lot of different factors, not just about production or organization of the service, but also on the other parts of the entire ecosystem. But I think we're well on our way. We should not get frustrated. We should not say that it's now impossible to fix, that we're not going to hit 1.5 degrees, because every fraction of a degree in the average temperature means a lot. It means a lot of lives. It means a lot of things. So we can't take the luxury of saying that it's over, right? This is a battle that is going to have a cost, of course. It's going to have an incentive also. And we really want to participate in this process. We really want to work towards sustainable development. And we don't really have a choice, right? So having said that, unfortunately, I have to conclude the session, the Q&A, so that I can give them the opportunity to, to share a final closing thought in terms of, well, whatever this webinar, everything that it was about. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to our audience. Thank you for your observations and your interventions. And thank you for all the questions. And well, right now we're about to hit the time. So I'm, I'm going to shorten what I was going to say. I'm just going to thank first Fernando for reminding us about a very long story of electromobility, but that has only been leveraged recently, you know, the advantages of these kinds of vehicles. And of course, what we can observe right now it's a kind of renaissance of these kinds of vehicles. And I would also like to thank Debbie for her observations about how the sector is part of the, the transition process, the social economic transition. I'm talking about incorporating some elements that can help us curb emissions and it will help us introduce greater wealth resilience, of course, within our economic systems in facing the impacts of climate change. I would also like to thank Mariela for her tema. De electromovilidad, eh, que está, description of the ecosystem, tanto a nivel global como eh, en México. This ecosystem that is taking shape both at a global level and in Mexico. And Salomón, thank you for the very specific examples as to how some important companies in the country are betting on electromobility. And they've done that for some time now. The case of Bimbo, for example, and they're looking to solve the challenge of financing for these vehicles, which is a big challenge. And I would also like to thank Nazareth for her observations in terms of how to overcome the challenge of financing and also acknowledge the contribution 
of the small scale, their small scale production and how they are impacting the offer of electric vehicles in the country. And this goes to the opportunity represented by these supply chains for not just for large companies, but also for small and medium companies in Mexico. And finally, I would like to thank Fernando Paez for the comments about incorporation of electrical vehicles in public transportation. And I would also like to acknowledge that this is not in itself a solution. Rather, it's part of a broad strategy so that we can recover public transportation in our country. It's facing serious challenges, serious financial problems, and other kinds of problems as well. I would like to thank all of you for your presence, for your participation today. Unfortunately, we were not able to cover everything because time was limited. So we will try to follow up as much as possible. I'm talking about the other questions in the chat. And I would also like to mention that we are going to send you a recording of the webinar, a recording for everybody who registered so that you have a record of the conversation that we've had. And finally, I just want to thank also all the people who worked backstage, right behind the curtain for this webinar. So I would like to thank Ernesto Hanhausen for his support in organizing this, Tania Jimenez and Paula Berber from WRI for their technical support, Payal Chaniramani and Priscilla Ford, part of Monix. Thank you for your support. And also the interpreters, Carlos Arroyo and Diego Noreña. So having said that, the webinar is now concluded. So thank you everybody for your participation and for your attention. Sorry for going over the time a little bit. So have a great day and we will continue with this discussion next week at 4 p.m. Mexico time. Then we'll have the second session where we will be focusing on the topic of sustainable building as part of this whole process of urbanism. So having said that, thank you 